Hello. So another college resource. Um, this is from the book Addictions from a Detachment Perspective. Do broken bonds and early trauma lead to addiction? By Richard Gill. Um, this one is chapter eight, Technology, Attachment, and Sexual Addiction. By Kara Crossan. Introduction. Um, since the 1980s, sexually active behaviors has received an increased amount of attention, with some arguing that this disorder should either be classified as a sexual composure, hypersexuality, or problematic sexual behavior. Amongst clinicians, there appears to be a lack of consensus when writing about this topic. Um, there has been a great deal of controversy regarding how we define sexual addiction, with the definition differing between articles. Authors such as Clinchman and Rompa and Quadland have changed the definition several times throughout their papers. The lack of research supporting any one particular theory or concept has helped explain why some clinicians have used the terms interchangeably. The internet has changed the face of sexual addiction and how clients are presenting for treatment. This actually makes me think of a movie I watched called Choke. I think they actually, in that movie, did a great, great job um, talking about sexual addiction and some of the, you had, it was done as a comedy, um, but you had, because you had some of the common ones you've heard, but, it was actually, I think, really well done. Maybe at some point I will watch the movie again and give my thoughts about it. Um, anyway, so increasing number of clients and their partners are seeking treatment for excessive porn use, anonymous sex, and prostitution, uh, with many spending inordinary amounts of time on social networking sites. Um, Actually, with everything going on with COVID-19, this actually might be increased because more people are staying home. So they're online more and like they could actually, I feel like they could become addicted because they're on online all the time. They're using, they might be using an excessive amount of porn and they might get used to it and they might, you know, start craving that release during stressful times and that's what they run to. Um, G-R-I-N-D-R, -R, a J geo-social networking application geared towards gay, bisexual, and bi-curious men has 3,000 users a day on social networking, with the users logging on approximately eight times per day and spending an average of 1.3 hours using the app. The application now has versions in 180 countries around the world. There are different theories about why people become sex addicted we can't come sex addicted. Um, Carnes is probably the most prolific writer on the topic and has credited with naming this problem sexual addiction. Carnes believes its roots, it's rooted um, in early development attachment failure with primary caregivers. By understanding the implications of early attachment by, between infant and primary caregivers, we may get closer to the origins of sexual addiction. So we come back to attachment because that's what the whole book is about. Balbi viewed attachment as a strong affectional bond between the primary caregiver and the child. Attachment patterns have to do with how the infant is um, tended to by the primary caregiver. There are four attachment patterns that they kind of discuss. Um, I'm not going to go into them, but you have the secure attachment bond, which is the healthy, secure bond. An insecure bond, when the caregiver is neglectful or of the child's needs or emotionally um, dysregulated. Anxiously attached men and women are high levels of obsession when compared to other attachment styles. So. Working with clients who have sex addiction is a complex as addiction itself. I kind of like that because it is something I don't think I've ever heard that much of. 
um, Carnes believes by breaking the secrecy and the shame of addiction, recovery is possible. Um, I feel like addiction itself is... has a stigma. It does. It really does. The sex addict um, has a stigma all special its own because people can be like, well... Okay, I, I think I can get people to understand I have an addiction... It may have started as a choice. The choice was, you know, but it became a disease because that choice affected my brain patterns, which I once read an article about. Um, with sex addict, it's hard to say that because you don't have anything that's directly affecting your brain patterns the way a chemical dependency would. Um, so people would be like, well, if that's the case, why don't you just stop? But it's much different than that. Um, this goes on to say that people with addictions, regardless of the nature of the addiction, are typically dysregulated. They are seeking relief from underlying issues, like emotional pain, depression, or anxiety. People with a sexual addiction have learned to either escape or avoid strong feelings through the addictive use of sexual behaviors and are um, often mul multiple addictions. Various studies have explored how negative effects such as shame could be a precursor to sexual addiction. Sexual addiction is an addiction, and it is very important to look beyond the client's sexual behaviors when addressing their therapeutic options, and recovery as an integrated therapeutic approach needs to be considered. Recovery has shown that 12-step programs such as Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous and Relapse Prevention Groups are effective strategies for treating sexual addiction. I've actually always wondered about that. There, I've actually looked. Um, there used to be one in this area um, that was done by the Bangor Area Recovery Network. I'm not sure if they still do it, but it has been taken off of their... Um, programming. And they tell us a story here about Michael. Um, and how basically his earliest childhood memories include daily masturbation and viewing sexually special images. Found tucked away in a boxes in his father's garage. He described his father as being aloof and absent, often working away from home. Later, colleagues of Michael's father would describe him as being a ladies' man and bragging about his father's VIP status at strip clubs and the like. From this, Michael learned that sexual conquest and anonymous sex were seen as manly and heroic. Um, Michael's mother was a model and came from a family of secrets. Her childhood was turbulent and she was sexually abused for many years. She was chronically dysregulated. Michael grew up experiencing his mother as depressed, anxious, and unavailable to him. Michael was offered weekly one-on-one -on -one therapy, a male recovery group, and the recommendation that he attend 12-step fellowship. Uh, he revealed that at his young age, he had been in turbulent relationship and had remained in this, that relation for three years, despite the emotional abuse he experienced. Michael was consistently belittled by his partner for failing to satisfy her, and he came to experience sex as shameful. After the breakup, Michael became afraid of and avoiding intimacy. So, through this, he had turned to substances and sexual behaviors to find temporary relief from his own internal dysregulation, because that is what he learned as a child. And now it's happening again. He needs that, feels like he needs something to help him. So he turns to sexual and substances. So his mother, uh, later in therapy, it was revealed that she feared that such contact would be seen as unhealthy and not keen to sex abuse. Um, so when there is a failure to internalize soothing behaviors during childhood, addictive behaviors might become the primary method of regulation. See, that is quite interesting to me, and like I love, I 
I mean, I love these articles because I think they get to a topic, like, that's quite interesting. So that one was about, you know, sex addiction and likes that and how that can, broken bonds and stuff can lead to it later in life. Now, at one point, um, I actually looked up what the criteria for sexual addiction was, but the thing is, there's not a lot of consistency. It seems to just be, if it affects your daily way of living um, in an unhealthy manner. So, you know, but anyway, thanks for watching.